So how do we do the routing with this classless addressing? So each network, we just need to know the length of the, um, uh, the prefix and the value, the network number uh, that applies. And so all the routers have to understand uh, this routing scheme. <coughs> Otherwise, uh, they won't be able to, um, uh, to deliver. So an ISP might have a whole bunch of customers that fit within a large allocation that is contiguous that can be summarized in this way. So here we have uh, you know, uh, several of them, um, but they can all be summarized as 128.1.112.128 if the prefix is reduced to only 21 bits. Uh, because the, obviously 128.1.12.128 slash 24 fits in that. The, net, the number is the same and the prefix is longer, so it refers to a smaller network. Then we have dot 129 instead of dot 128. So the 121 is three bits less than 24. So two to the power of three, there's eight possibilities. So it'll be 128 is the lowest, 129, 130, 131, 132, uh, 133, 134, 135. So anything up to 128.112.135 slash 24 will also fit in there. So ISPs would tend to get allocated large contiguous blocks precisely so that they can then advertise uh, a much smaller aggregated uh, route uh, to, the, uh, to the backbone. So this means that we can reduce the number of routes that we need to have and yet still be efficient about the use uh, of the, um, uh, the IPv4 address space. So now if we have a look uh, at how we do the forwarding of IP uh, packets with CIDR, it means that our uh, subnet masks uh, are different. We don't just have the fixed uh, 8, 16, 24 or anything. We have to allow for prefix of any length realistically between uh, 2 and 32 bits uh, in the address. And it's also possible that you might have routes that overlap uh, and that may be intentional and quite uh, reasonable. So in general, if this happens, and this actually brings a nice strength out of being able to have multiple entries that match. If you have a longer rule that matches, you assume that that is a more specific route to uh, a particular place and that the more specific route has been added because it's better than the general route. Um, so the packet will get sent to the more specific uh, route. So if we had 171.69 and 171.69.10, um, we would send a packet address to 171.69.20.5. Um, we have to deliver it to the, the broader one because it doesn't fit in the smaller one. But if we wanted to deliver a packet uh, that was what, addressed to 171.69.10.5, that would fit in the more specific route. And so we would send it into that more specific route. Okay, so that's the routing at the whole level. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, you know, having to do the Ethernet addresses, for example, uh, you know, for the underlying network. Because again, remember that an Ethernet network uses Ethernet addresses, not IP addresses. So we need to be able to map down to that, or indeed for any other network uh, physical layer, uh, it may well be using it. Well, it should be using a different addressing scheme if it has an addressing scheme at all, because it's in a different layer. Um, so we need to know the, um, the IP address of a destination host on the same network. And we also need to know the IP address of the next hop router. Again, as we said uh, in an earlier video, so that if we need to send things to that router, uh, the IP address doesn't change in the packet in the encapsulation as we go down, but the, uh, the ethernet or the physical layer address does change. Um, and so there's a, a number of different ways that you could do that. You could actually have the, um, the physical address and the IP address uh, being matched up in some way so that they have to have some predictable relationship. Um, you could do that more flexibly. You could just have a table-based approach where you actually have a table mapping between the two. And so the address resolution protocol was designed to provide exactly this function, to populate and update that table without the higher levels uh, of the, uh, the network stack needing to know. So it binds or maps IP addresses to the physical addresses uh, that they're connectable at. Um, so if uh, you want to send an IP packet to a host and you don't yet know its physical address on the local network, for example, 
um, ARP will broadcast the request saying, who has this IP address? The target machine will respond saying, uh, you know, here I am, which will implicitly have come from the physical layer address of that machine. Um, and it might also include additional information about other physical interfaces it's available on. And then the ARP table uh, on the original sender that wanted to send the, uh, the packet will update its table and now be able to send uh, to that destination directly. Um, if they're not updated in a certain time frame, then the ARP entries will expire uh, so that we don't have stale entries uh, hanging around uh, causing problems. So if you needed to change the physical network address on a, a host, you can do that. And so this provides, as we say, that mapping so that uh, that abstraction between the um, IP uh, networking layer at layer three and the data link layer at layer two uh, can work. We don't uh, break uh, the layering, but we have to provide the mapping between the addresses uh, to facilitate that. So the an ARP packet um, will indicate the uh, the hardware type. So for example, Ethernet will be hardware type one. Uh, the protocol type uh, that's being used. Um, and we have uh, what's uh, most interesting to us. So the, the source hardware address um, and the source uh, protocol address. So these are offsets into uh, the ARP packet. Uh, and essentially we need the information in there so that we can say, right, what is my hardware address? What is my uh, IP address? Um, that we want to have resolved. And then there's fields in there for getting the, uh, the responses uh, from the, um, uh, the target, which will then populate them into the ARP response uh, packet. Uh, the operations, whether it's a, a request or a response, if it's IPv4, then the, uh, the, uh, the protocol length of the addresses will be 32 bits. If it's ethernet, the hardware length will be 48 bits. And so this is all, uh, again, encoded uh, in there. So ARP can work. It doesn't need to work with IPv4 and ethernet. It can work with any combination in theory of a protocol address, which is the IP or the upper layer and the physical, which is the lower uh, address type. So again, the, uh, in doing this mapping, the uh, host address, so the Ethernet addresses, if we're talking about Ethernet, will be configured in by the manufacturer usually, and they will usually be unique, not guaranteed. We've seen plenty of instances where this hasn't happened through manufacturer error or otherwise. Um, the IP addresses are, are required to be globally unique. Uh, again, we'll talk about NAT later, that breaks this rule, uh, but they're expected to be uh, globally unique for a given uh, internet. Uh, or into network if you want to be more precise in that um, and are reflective of the structure of the internet network so whereas the ip addresses if it's so ethernet addresses rather are if you like randomly allocated to network cards uh, and they can all be completely unrelated to each other on a single network segment all the ip addresses actually should be or they need to be if the devices are going to communicate on the same network uh, and so we can configure uh, this kind of information manually. Uh, so you, in most operating systems will let you manually put an IP address in and set the network mask and all of these details, a default route uh, and the like. But this is a bit annoying. If you move a host, you have to change it. Maybe you can put errors, uh, you can have it put mistakes in it as you do it. So it would be really nice to have an automated configuration process. Uh, and there's a couple of different options to that, which we will look at in the next video.